afternoon. Good evening. How you guys doing? My name is Quinn Jacobson, and welcome to the Studio Q Show Live. Good to see you guys in here this morning. Whenever you may be watching or listening to this, good afternoon, good evening. It's good to see you. I hope everybody's happy and healthy and well and all that good stuff. Hello, Jeffrey and Hank and Pablo. Good to see you in the live room. That's that's bold to come in here and show people who you are, right? It's it's tough. So most people are on uh, YouTube. We've got some good stuff for you to uh, check out today. I think you'll enjoy it. It's kind of a hodgepodge. I went through uh, a couple of books, answered a couple of questions on um, email and some technical stuff and all that good stuff. So I think you guys will enjoy this. I put the, a couple of links in the the chat. Maybe let me. Oh, they're not in the private chat, are they? Or are they? In the private chat, I don't know. Um, I can copy this and send it, but we'll we'll get to these um, when recommended reading and recommended watching and some new stuff. So let's jump over here and do this. This is the best way to start, just to get going. Uh, share this file. Get get my uh, little presentation up here so I can keep on board on track with everything. So today is September 11th. I cannot believe it. That is crazy. Um, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to look at uh, a manual of photographic chemistry by Hardwich. If you don't have this book, you should grab it on Google or Google Books. It is just amazing. Um, you, you'll enjoy what we, we get into today. I think you will anyway. Um, oh, good. Jeffrey's copied it from the YouTube chat. Awesome. Good. Yeah. So. Hey, well, good afternoon. Well, good eat, get it from PA. Uh, Thilo, hello, everyone. <laughs> wash hands. Yeah, wash hands, wear a mask, and keep six feet away, or at least two meters. And Jan from Norway, hello, and howdy from t to Tom and Chris. Hello, everybody. That's good to see everybody. Appreciate you chiming in. That's That's great. I love our little community here. It's not huge. doesn't need to be. I don't want it to be anyway. We're just kind of here together sharing information, uh, sharing ideas, and that's what we'd like to do. So let's jump over here and do this. Um, so there's a Hardwich book we're going to look at, news and social media. Um, and I appreciate uh, people sending me stuff. Jeffrey sent me the link on what we're going to share in the, the social media and the news today and all that. I don't know if you guys knew, but last week, a few days ago, Kodak in 1888, George Eastman received a patent for the camera that would become to known, known as the Kodak. You press the button, we do the rest. Um, this is an interesting topic because uh, I was doing a couple of things, and we'll get into this. I, you know the book um, the Kodak released on wet collodion negatives? All they do is talk about their uh, iodized collodion in there, and there's no recipe, right, because they want you to buy their collodion and that kind of thing. Well, I did some research and I found the patent on their collodion. I'm going to share that with you this morning or today or this show rather. And you can see what the, the big mystery was. And it's, it's interesting. It is. Um, but while I was looking at patents, um, I ran across this as well. And, and so this just a few days ago, just a week ago, in 1888, George Eastman got that patent for the Kodak camera. I have one of these back here somewhere on the shelf up top there. Um, <clears throat> you got 100 frames, 100, 100 images. You shot them, you sent the camera back in, they developed, processed the negative prints, and then sent your camera back loaded. It was quite expensive, but the, the question here is, is what impact do you think this had? Is it good or is it bad? We can we can talk about that a little bit and, and kind of address the democratization or uh, bringing in uh, photography for the masses, right? And we had a recent revolution about 20 years ago with digital cameras. That kind of, so each each uh, century or a couple of them, I guess, maybe if you want to be technical about it, but each century brought this kind of new, uh, there, there was a group of people who worked in photography. So up to this plate, it was wet point or wet plate, wet, wet point. It was daguerreotypes, calotypes, talbotypes, paper negatives, pot printing, wet collodion, dry plates, gelatin dry plates, and now uh, into this 
you press the button and we do the rest kind of thing right before the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. And right at the turn of the 20th to the 21st century, they introduced the digital phenomenon, which separated. Now, I don't care what shutter speed it is. I don't care what aperture it is. I just kind of point. If it's wrong, I just take it in Lightroom or Photoshop and fix it. So the question is, is does this democratization, does this uh, making photography available to the layperson, uh, it really hurt with the digital revolution. It really hurt the professional photographer in a lot of ways because now, you know, my cousin's uh, boy ha bought just bought a Nikon or a Canon camera and they can shoot your wedding for nothing. Um, uh, you know, commercial projects kind of went, you, now it's even more extreme with the software and everything. I'm not, I'm not speaking about, about that in the pejorative. I don't mean it to be necessarily bad. What I'm, the question that I'm interested in asking is what did it do to photography and why is it, why are we now throwing back and going back to these old processes and these handmade processes. You know, one of the things I love to watch are uh, programs on people making things with, by hand, old techniques, taking refurbishing things that are from the 19th century and working with them and seeing how they were made. And all of that stuff is gone, right? All these, these, these things are kind of these skills and this, this technical uh, prowess is kind of gone. Now we're dependent on people coming in, fixing our stuff, throwing it away. Normally we buy something, it breaks a month later, we throw it away and buy a new one, right? So photography has this kind of history. It has, you know, going from the, the dry plate, the, the, all the previous processes, dry plate, and now this plastic film roll and a little camera they send to you right before the 19th turn of the 20 into the 20th century and now everybody's making images the good side of that is that now family photographs are common now people can document you know their great great grandparents and those kinds of things you know if if, if they were into that um and, and then the turn of the into the digital age it's a it, it's an interesting question we should have a conversation about it sometime Hola, hola, Pablo. Good to see you. I'm glad you made it in. That's awesome. Um, so, and um, greetings to uh, Chad uh, from the north end, uh, from the north and end of NWT. Okay, I don't know what Northwest Territory. I would imagine that's Australia. Boy, you're up late, my brother. You are up late. Well, welcome, welcome. So. Anyway, it was interesting. This last week was the anniversary of the uh, Kodak camera. You press the button, we do the rest. Quite a slogan, uh, meaning that, hey, no skills involved here, man. You, you press the button and we'll, we'll take care of it from there. So interesting. We should have a conversation about that sometime. That was in the news or I found it searching patents. And Jeffrey sent me this as well. I appreciate that, Jeffrey. But this is Shin uh, Sagino or uh, uh, Thilo could help us out here. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but Shin posted, you see the image on the right, um, the two images. Shin posted this image from the mid-70s that he had done in Nova Scotia, Canada. And I think it was 1976, 74, something like that. Uh, had his tintype done up there in the Sherbrooke. Uh, Dale Wilson that's usually on the board here. He's involved with that. There's a great article about him coming back 45 years later. Or so, somewhere in there, I don't know. Some in the you know almost a half a century later, and having his portrait redone in this 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 uh, Sherbrooke Sherbrooke. I'm not sure how you pronounce the name. Um, Tintype Studio. It's been running for like 50 years now or, or longer. It's the oh, Thyla says stress on the first syllable. Okay, syllabus or syllable? Yes, <laughs> Sugino. Okay, maybe that's his name, but I call him Shin. She had posted this image a long time ago on one of my forums, and it was very interesting. He said, I had this tintype done in the 70s. Why I post this is not only is it really amazing to see uh, a studio up and going for this in decades long uh, uh, in Nova Scotia, Canada there, um, but it kind of puts the, the myth of this, this process that ever went away. It's never really gone away. There's people that have kind of revived it in certain areas here or there, but it's never really gone away. It's always, there's always been somebody working in the process somehow. And this is uh, 
this is a very interesting story. I put the link in the comments here, uh, the cbc.ca link. You go listen to it. Uh, Dale's interviewed in it. It's it's a nice little piece. I think, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but the narrator, the journalist, is the daughter of the Sherbrooke uh, photographer. So Jeffrey's shaking his head. Yeah, that's true. So it, it's a nice little close-knit thing. Uh, the studio's back up. Dale just built a new uh, studio there, I believe. And Shin had his portrait done. I think that's real. Yeah, 45 years. Special reunion to recreate a tintype portrait. That's great. Go check that out. Listen to it. It's three or five minutes long. Very well worth your time. Very interesting. It's it's a great piece. Um, and yeah, 15 years ago, he was inspired to learn the process himself. Yeah, Rose Murphy is the from Canadian Broadcasting Company that does it. Yeah, great stuff. Go check that out. So. I talked to you uh, a few weeks ago. I don't know how many shows ago. I, I look today, I've done over 200 of these shows. So there's a couple of them out there. But one of the shows in the last few months, we talked about the Kodak manual, the making of the wet collodion negative. More of a, just a technical manual from the 20s and 30s. It's a little pamphlet. Um, a really good book, really good little in, set of information. But they never talked about their formula for collodion. They just say Kodak iodized collodion is the best stuff going and you do this and you do that. And so it's hunting around where I ran into the patent for the Kodak camera, I ran into this as well. This is the actual patent for, for Alexander Murray of Rochester, New York. And he's assigned to the Eastman Kodak Company. He's the representative of Rochester, New York, the Kodak Company. Collodion for wet, the wet plate process or wet plate process. And this was this was filed in March eight, March eighteenth, nineteen thirty. And you can see right there, you can see the alcohol, the ether. That's a liter combined, a cc or milliliters. The cellulose or pyroxylene, 10.6 grams ammonium iodide, cadmium iodide, calcium chloride, and acetone. And if you look this patent up, their numbers right there. You can search it easily and find it. If you look this patent up you'll find that they added the acetone for the longevity of the clothing. So it didn't decompose and turn red. It's a very interesting, you can read on, I, I didn't want to go into all of it, but it was just an interesting find. It was bothering me that I, like, what is this Kodak iodized collodion? What is this? We want to know about it. And uh, I found his patent and there it is. It, this was a little after, actually there's been four or five iterations of that little pamphlet, uh, what uh the making of wet clothing negatives by the Eastman Kodak Company. Um, that I think there's four or five editions, like I said, um, and they start as early as 1922 and go into the late 1930s. So this is definitely filed for a patent. This is definitely their their mixture for the clothing they use in that book. And again, that, that's for line drawings and technical work like that. But still, I mean making negatives or making negatives. So the acetone was interesting. The calcium chloride was interesting. And the other products are pretty straightforward there. So I thought you might find that interesting. I know I did. Just hunting it down and finding it was was fun. Oh, oh, right there. It says, uh, this formula is found in the Handbook of Photo Engraving by N.S. Amstutz, 1907, page 126. The acetone only being added to the formula is given. I looked that book up. I have that book as well. Now we'll, we'll maybe look at that at some point in time on one of these shows. That's a very interesting book as well, too. So we're going to look at this manual of photography, photographic chemistry, sorry, by T. Frederick Hardwich, 1855. This is an early book. Again, I've, I've always iterate and reiterated that I like the later manuals, but some of these just have these great tidbits of information in, and I wanted to share a couple of them with you today. And Hardwich is, is definitely uh, one of my favorite. This is in section two of the book, as you can see. Chemistry of the various substances employed as developers. This is going to be an interesting conversation because I've got some stories to tell about this. Oh, mini photon. He says, would any anyone going to try out the Kodak for me? I'm sure there will be somebody. Uh, that tries out that Kodak formula. Um, that, you know, you've got cadmium iodide in there and you've got acetone in there. You could leave the acetone out if you didn't want to put that in there. But that's going to preserve that stuff for an incredible long, uh, just the CDI, just the cadmium iodide alone 
is very stable and it's going to, you know, it's going to produce, it, it'll, it'll, it will not decompose for a very long time. So I might recommend leaving the acetone out, depending on where you're at and what you want to do. Um, Chad says, as a relative beginner, curious why chlorides aren't used in most collodion recipes. Well, there, there's a difference. Chlorides, uh, so you have four different types of uh, uh, halogens, right? You have bromide, iodide, bromide, chloride, and, and uh, fluoride. If, uh, so, so there's four of them. We use mainly three of them. The first two iodides and bromides are used in making a positive or negative, and chlorides are usually used in the printing. Uh, very slow. It's very slow for one reason to answer that question, but you can definitely use them, right? You can experiment and find out how to use them, but uh, that's a great recipe to go off of that patent right there if you wanted to use the uh, chloride in it. So interesting. Good questions. Yeah. And somebody try that formula out. That would that'd be cool uh, to see that. So let's talk about these uh, various substances employed as developers. Um, this is, again, this is Hardwich's book. This is very interesting. The most important of these bodies employed by the photographer to develop the latent image are as follows. Gaelic acid, pyrogaelic acid, and the proto salts of iron, meaning there's two, there's, there's two varieties. We're only going to Talk, well, we'll talk about both of them, but we only really use the one and it's kind of converted into the other, as, as we'll find out here. But the chemistry of Gaelic and pyrogaelic acids. A, of the Gaelic acid, Gaelic acid is obtained from gall nuts. Does anybody know what gall nuts are? Um, if you have my book, chem, Chemical Pictures, the new one, on the front of it, there's a rabbit skull and it's sitting on gall nuts. Those gall nuts are formed in trees, usually oak trees, um, um, different, different types of trees, cottonwoods. Actually, I think I got mine from the cottonwood tree. The wasp comes along. The insect, the wasp comes along and lays its eggs. The gall wasp lays its eggs in the bark or the limb of the tree. And that tree forms a shell around it to protect those eggs from invading the tree. It's the tree's defense mechanism. And it forms a hard shell around it, forms a gall nut, and it falls off the tree. I use it as a metaphor of the Europeans invading the indigenous people in North America here. And that's why that rabbit skull and rabbit skull is a different story. But on the cover of my book, those are gall nuts. And that's how they're formed. And that's what they're, that's the kind of the story behind them. So uh, came from gallants, which are particular uh, um, excretions formed upon the branches and shoots of the Quericus infectoria, the type of tree, by the puncture of a certain species of insect. Well, those in this case, these are wasps, but that's that's fine. The best kind is imported from Turkey and sold in commerce as Aleppo galls. Aleppo's in Syria, but that's okay. Gall nuts do not contain Gaelic acid ready formed, but an analogous chemical principle termed tannic acid. That rings a bell too, right? Tannic acid. We talked about dry plates in the last couple of weeks. So here we go. As you start looking in the history of photography and looking at these chemical properties and processes, you're going to see these big themes come up and these variations of these compounds and chemicals and and, and what they're formed out of. And, and it really it, it really starts making good sense after a while. Um, the term tannic acid, well known for its astringent properties and employment in the process of tanning rawhides. We talked about tannins. That's where it gets it, tanning the, the, the cattle and any hide of an animal. Gaelic acid is produced by the decomposition and oxidation of tannic acid when the powdered galls are exposed for a long time in a moist state to the action of air, right? They're, they're oxidized. Being only sparingly soluble in cold water, the acid is easily purified by crystallization. Gaelic acid is a very feeble acid substance. This is a difference between the two, pyro and, and Gaelic. It is usually sold in the form of a long, silky needle, needles of an astringent taste, uh, yeah, definitely, which dissolve readily in boiling water but are only springingly soluble in the cold. So that's Gaelic acid. That's the first big developer in these processes. Now let's talk about pyrogaelic acid. People confuse these two. 
And I always talk about, and especially if you if you have my book, you'll see that I talk about chemical abstract CAS numbers. Always order chemicals by CAS numbers because some of these names have, are very similar. And if you're not used to it, you'll you'll get them twisted around, and you'll get, you know, the different compounds sent to you by name versus a CAS. So pyrogalic acid. This is gallic acid, but it's pyrogalic acid. How is that made? The term pyro, think about it, right? F prefix to the gallic acid signifies that the new substance is obtained by the action of heat upon that body at a temperature of about 410 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's uh, that's that's up there, right? That's that's hundreds of Celsius, 410 Fahrenheit. I don't know that the Celsius conversion right off the top of my head. Gallic acid is decomposed and a white sublimate forms which condenses in lamellar crystals this is pyrogalic acid pyrogalic acid is far more soluble in cold water than gallic gallic acid and absorbs oxygen with greater uh, it absorbs oxygen great with a greater intensity consequently it forms a more powerful developer so those are the difference he says gallic acid is a weak kind of a feeble acid right and pyro is a strong acid. In this case, we're talking about developers. Um, uh, forms a power, more powerful developer. Although it is termed an acid, it may, for all practical practical purposes, be locked, uh, looked upon as a neutral substance, since it is neither, neither red litmus paper nor forms salts with its alkaline basis. So the acid word is, uh, what he's saying there, it's, it's kind of a misnomer. It doesn't turn, it's not a Low pH. It's not like a pH two or three, and it's not a pH fourteen. It's more neutral around a pH seven. If you're talking about pH values, the nature of the compound formed by the union of gallic and pyrogallic acids with oxygen has not been determined. <laughs> this is 1855. So of course, um, let's talk about the chemistry of proto salts of iron. So so we've got the two py the gallic and the pyrogallic acid. We use mainly pyrogallic acid in the development of wet collodion negatives and or the redevelopment, especially wet collodion negatives. And now let's talk about the ferrous sulfate. We, he, they have a little different names for them here in the 19th century, but th this is we're talking about ferrous sulfate in this next section. The combinations of iron with oxygen are somewhat numerous. There are two distinct oxides, each of which forms a class of salts a.k.a. the proto-oxide of iron containing an atom of oxygen to one of metal, and the peroxide, which and we'll talk about that, which is an atom and a half of oxygen to one metal. As half atoms, however, are not spoken of in chemical language, it is usually to say that the peroxide of iron contains three equivalents of oxygen to two metallic iron, expressed in these symbols, and you can see them there. Now, both of these oxides, as before said, form a class of salts with various acids. But these salts do not all resemble each other in their physical and chemical properties. The proto-salts are, usually speaking, of an apple green color. That sounds familiar, right? And form a, a solution in water which is almost colorless, if not very highly concentrated. So when you mix your iron in your water, in your distilled water to make your developer, Sometimes it's a green, sometimes it's a, a straw yellow, but mostly clear. But that iron will start immediately to oxidize, so it, it may take on a green color quite quickly. The pear salts or pear salts, on the other hand, are dark and give a yellow or even blood red solution. As photographers, we have to deal only with proto salts of iron. So talk, talking about the ferrous sulfate. But it, it is quite essential that we should understand the properties of both. Therefore, in order to illustrate what has been said, let the student take a crystal of, uh, whoop, sorry, I missed that. Um, but he goes, on to he goes on to talk about taking a crystal of, of ferrous sulfate and watch it change over time with oxidation. That's why your developer goes from a, a colorless or light green exposed to oxygen and it go, starts to go into a, 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 a light yellow, a darker yellow, an orange, and then finally a red. Kind of like collodion, right? But this is rust. This is iron. So these are changing um, from uh, 
the, the light color, non-oxidized, exposed to oxygen and in, in the water in water and used and and starts to change into that rust color. I I I like the developer. I've used it very red, very very highly oxidized, um, but I like it fresh. It's snappier. It produces a, a better color on the image especially if you're doing positives. That's really the only place I use ferrous sulfite. I use a pyrogalic acid for the negatives. And we've talked about that quite a bit. Um, oh, so no bromide in their formula. I missed that, Jeffrey. Yes, I know. Huh? That's kind of interesting. Yeah, they uh, they have a, a going along the lines of uh, the I, uh, of, of uh, our, our friend um, Sutton, right? The two types of iodized collodion and bromo iodized collodion they're making negative so it kind of makes sense and remember there there are caveats there if you only use the iodizer and if you make this stuff from the kodak manual the, the patent remember these are for negatives they're not for positives so don't don't confuse those two so the the, the developers are interesting because the strongest is the pyrogalic acid the weaker uh the more feeble is the, the term they used back back in the day uh, is the ferrous sulfate. So you, you can substitute these things. Like if you want to redevelop a negative, you could use ferrous sulfate, but it's not going to be as strong as pyrogalic acid. Um, gallic acid is a more, more feeble acid, yet stronger even than ferrous sulfate. But the two main, the main ones we use are ferrous sulfate and, uh, and pyrogalic acid, both respectively to do positives and negatives. And or to, you can do negatives with ferrous sulfate, a soft negative, and redevelop with pyrogalic acid. But I thought it was interesting to learn that the, the gallnuts produce the gallic, uh, gallic acid or the gallnuts produce that. Uh, the decomposition, the heat, the pyro turns it into pyrogalic acid, a much stronger developer. Um, those are good things just to have general knowledge of. The next thing I wanted to talk about is light. In his book, and I guarantee you, you should... It's free. Go download it and read it. It's like six or seven hundred pages. But I love how he describes the light. And not long ago, there was a post on the Facebook page uh, on the, the Wet Collodion Forum talking about white. And there's there's a there's a misnomer out there because the, it's it's deceiving with collodion and and mainly talking about positives here. People use all kinds of light. To, to make positives. You can make positives with tungsten light. You can shoot the moon. You can use street light. You can use, you know, 3000 Kelvin, Kelvin temperature light. Um, but, but what we're talking about is optimal light and what is the best light to work with collodion. And this is what um, Hardwich talks about here. He's talking about what the, the spectrum of light, the visible spectrum of light, and you can see you can see where the visor we, we fall off down in the, the violet and the, the indigo colors. It falls off into the UV. And up in the red, we go up into the what the gamma, right? So <clears throat> that's our visible spectrum. And what does collodion see? I have an illustration, and I showed this quite a few times, of what, what collodion sees as white, which is the indigo violet blue color down near the UV and even into the UV spectrum. And then what it sees is black, which starts basically at yellow. I really like to say red, and it, because it depends on the hue of yellow. But let's go. Let's go through this and just read this. Um, the space illuminated and colored by a pencil of rays analyzed in this way is called the solar spectrum. Without inquiring at present into the cause of the decomposition, which we will be explained as we proceed, we notice that seven principal colors may be distinguished in the solar spectrum spectrum red orange yellow green blue indigo and violet it was imagined by sir isaac newton that these were in reality primary colors of white light but sir david brewster has shown more recently that such is not the case that the primary colors are only three in number red yellow and blue and that the other lights follow uh following experiments performed um for that purpose uh, performed for that purpose so experiment number one Expose a layer of silver iodide to the prismatic spectrum for a short time and then proceed to bring out the effects produced by means of a developing agent. It, it will be seen that the darkening is most decided in the indigo and violet spaces. So this is what he's talking about here is 
expose it, um, a, a strip um, of, 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 you know, you're basically making a positive, develop it, and you're going to see what color is most, uh, resonates most with collodion. And that's the violet, indigo, and blue. That's why we consider collodion sees those as white or bright. And we're talking about, again, this actinic or UV light here. And people mistake this because, oh, I use strobes, you know, and that's not actinic or UV light. Or I use, uh, um, you know, even tungsten light I've seen people do make, make clothes. The exposures are extremely long. But I'm talking about the optimal light that collodion sees and, and utilizes. Uh, so that's and violet, spa uh, violet spaces. And that is extends upwards into a considerable distance, even beyond the visible spectrum meaning that he's saying it goes on up into the UV spectrum, collodion sees, and we know that. How do we know that? Because you photograph someone uh, that's slightly freckled or you can't even see freckles, it'll go down into their melanin, and you'll, you'll see freckles on a, a very light freckled person goes crazy, and sometimes you won't even see any freckles, and you'll that, that's, that's the UV penetrating their into their melanin. And, and also, too, if you've ever had a person wearing sun blocking makeup or UV protected um, contacts, those will go black. So we know that it goes in even beyond this little illustration here, past the violet into the UV out of the visible spectrum. That's what he's talking about. If traced in the opposite direction, it's found to diminish rapidly intensity until it reaches the green colored space. So a lot of people um, forget this that there's a very tiny window of light on the spectrum that collodion is sensitive to. And we got to keep this in mind as we look at scenes, as we photograph these complex situations. I don't know about you guys, but if you ever seen a wet collodion image, you, you have to look, it's very busy and you have to look and you, you have to look at it a few times to make out what it was or is that's, that's based a lot on the different colors in the scene and how collodion is reading them or not. And then the more complex you get, the more difficult it is to make out. Collodion is not for everything. You can't, collodion and, and color film or digital or whatever does not cross translate at all. You, there's a lot of scenes. There's a lot of things you can't photograph well in collodion. It has to do with the light spectrum, the busyness of the scene, um, how, how light falls off, what it's sensitive to, the colors it perceives or not, like I said. So there's there's a limited, can you photograph, you can photograph anything with collodion. I'm talking about, can you make sense of it? And is it a, is it a good image? Is it is it worthwhile? Is it readable? And 99% a, a of it has to do with this light spectrum. And people don't understand this light spectrum very well. Um, yes, you can make portraits with strobes. You can make, um, you know, like I said, you can go out and photograph the moon. That surely... Well, that is a little, you know, that's the sun shining, reflecting off. So that's a little different. But um, I've seen people use tungsten light, 3000 Kelvin temperature and make clothing images, you know, several minute exposures, those kinds of things. But keep in mind that um, this is a very limited spectrum. And keep in mind the, 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 the colors you're photographing in, the type of light you're using in the image and how busy or or how the scene is set up, your depth of field, your composition, all that really means a lot because you can make a convoluted, your eyes may see something and collodion translates it completely different. And it can be a convoluted mess that doesn't translate well at all. Keep this in mind. Very important. I see a lot of folks that don't understand this and they try to make images because they're thinking in color film, color digital you know, any type of light, you know, my 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 computer will adjust for, etc. Not true with collodion. It, it wants a specific type of light. It wants a. I even say the more simple scene is the better, cleaner read, well lit. You know, however you want to light it, and and the right colors in that. So keep that in mind. I didn't highlight this, but experiment number two: selective values of flowers, different shades of scarlet, blue, yellow, and make a, a photographic copy of them on uh, silver iodide. The blue tints will be found to act most violently on the sensitive compound, while the reds and yellow are scarcely visible. Probably they would not be seen upon the plate at all if it weren't, if it, at all, it, 
not that it is difficult to procure in nature. So what he's talking about there, I did a I did a uh, fruit bowl years ago, and the banana's black, the lemon's black, the apple's black. You know, there, there and ver various hues too. Actually, the banana had a little bit of green in the top, and you could see the transition there. Try some of these experiments, and that's with actinic light. That's with sunlight, natural light. This is what he's talking about here. So really super important to understand lighting, super important. Um, so technical questions. Uh, somebody asked about uh, uh, reconstituting old red collodion. And this is from the same book here. Um, he says, a simple process for re removing liberated iodine. We've talked about this a lot on this show. The amount of free iodine required to produce a lemon yellow color in the collodion is so excessively small that it can scarcely be said to produce an uh, appreciable effect in photographic point of view, meaning that they like to use barely off-colored collodion. Some of them like the orange stuff. Very few like the red. Um, when the tint, however, reaches an orange or red color, it may be desirable to remove it. This may be done by adding a small portion of a caustic alkali such as potash or ammonia. <clears throat> but better still, by the simple and ingenious plan proposed by Mr. Crooks, placing a piece of silver foil in the bottle containing the collodion and allowing it to remain as long as required. So what he's talking about there is tin foil, silver foil. Put it in your old red collodion. Um, silver iodide is first formed, which afterwards dissolved dissolves in the alkaline iodide, meaning that what it will do is it'll take up the iodine, reabsorb that, and literally liberate or fr uh, free that of that uh, liberated or free iodine and turn your collodion back into a, a yellow or a light color. A strip of metallic zinc likewise produces the same effect of decolorizing collodion. So those are a couple of, I've done the, I've done the uh, strip of foil. It's great. It has to be quite large. In my case, I was using 250 mil bottles, had a bottle of old red colonia. It probably took a week um, and it definitely reabsorbed that iodine in the collodion, which is interesting. If you want, if you have some old red collodion, you don't want to use it to, you know, uh, sensitize your bath or excite your bath or you don't want to make, you know, really contrasting negatives in the outdoors, that kind of thing. Try to reconstitute it with this. Uh, method and see. Um, so yeah, any technical questions you have, uh, holler at me here. We'll we'll move on here though. So obviously this week I'm going to recommend that you go over and download this um, a manual of photographic chemistry. I just I just picked a couple of things out and just barely touched on them. I didn't even go into hardly any detail at all with those. Um, go grab that book. It's it's like I said, it's six or seven hundred pages. Let me look here. Uh, oh, I've got the Anschutz book too here. Um, Clodian. Uh, let's see, a manual photograph. Let me open this up. I'll tell you how many pages it is. It is, oh, it's 409 pages. So it's a, it's a hefty book. It is loaded with information. Um, so much so. I, I think we'll continue on. If you grab the book, you'll definitely see. Um, you'll definitely you'll definitely see stuff that uh, will interest you for sure. I'll, I'll probably continue on with this book actually on these shows for a little while. There's so much um, uh, in there that we we can talk about, and and I think you'll find it uh, fascinating. But those are a couple. The developers, I thought that you know. Nobody ever talks about Gaelic and pyrogaelic acid, and we, we all kind of know ferrous sulfate, but I thought it was kind of interesting to talk about that. I'm going to plug myself a little bit this week, although I'm really, what I'm plugging is Andy or Andrew. Um, he does the flogger.co.uk. I put this link in the chat as well, too. He did an interview with me, I think it was last year. Justin Baruki, um, he's in New, uh, New Jersey. He does the pop-up uh, Clodian portraits in New York, around New York, Brooklyn, and Sometimes in New Jersey, Manhattan, Brooklyn. I don't know where he's at, but uh, he's back there somewhere. He's a friend of mine. Um, he recommended Andy uh, interview me, and, I, and he did. We had a great conversation. If you're at all interested in some of my philosophies in photography, 
some of my ideas of why I do my work and what I've done and what I'm doing, go check this out. It's a, it's a great, it's kind of funny. It's a great listen. If you have put it on when you're doing something that you can, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think, uh, Tom, let's see. I salt sun and settle out my used developer before decanting the water off. What to do with the used sodium thiosulfate. Hmm, okay. Let's see. Let's read that again. I salt sun and settle out my used developer before okay so so you're tr what you're trying to do is grab you're trying to salt it to get that silver chloride out right kind of like the old fix the film fix is that what you're saying i think you are what to do with the used sodium thiosulfate well there's a couple of things you can do with it um my philosophy is i i only use sodium thiosulfate for prints so um, you can salt that. Yeah, he said yes. Um, you can salt that and pull the sodium chloride out of it and wash it with water. And it, it's 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 like what you know, table salt, really. If you get the silver out of it, and it's, don't if you're on a septic system, do not put silver into your septic system. It will kill the bacteria. Silver is silver nitrate. Silver period is a great antibacterial. And it will kill your septic system, meaning your septic system will no longer break down the solid mass, and you'll fill up your your septic tank real quick with stuff. Yes, to remove the silver first, exactly. And after that, Tom, that's a great question, actually. After that, you can put it down the drain. I mean, literally. And you really shouldn't put anything with silver nitrate down your drain if you're on a city or county or whatever sewer system you're on. Although that's a mass quantity and the tiny portion of that probably wouldn't hurt. But if you're on a septic system, if you're outside of a, a city, county septic system, um, you know, don't put silver down your drain. Don't put any poisons. Don't do any of that. So you can you can get rid of that out. You take the silver chloride. He's putting salt in it, sunning it. He's removing the silver out of his uh, sodium thiosulfate. And he's saying, what do I do with this uh, leftover? Flush it. You can flush it. Definitely. Um, you could even put that down your septic system if you wanted to. Good question. Really good question. Um, that's really all I had uh, this week. Any, any, we got a few minutes here. If anybody wants to jot off into another direction or have a random question somewhere, um, I am happy. We're happy to address that. If I can't address it, there's somebody in here that can for sure. Um, let me see here. Let me see if I can find this. I was, I should have had this uh, before and I didn't. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick and I'll share it with you. Uh, <clears throat> it's a, it's that fruit shot with light. I thought, I, I don't know why I didn't think to uh, dig it up and, and po post it because it is, it is a, very interesting to, to look at, I think, if I can find it. I've got so much stuff. I don't know that I – I know it's in my one of my older books. Um, I don't see it here readily available. But I when I think about it, I think about the, the banana and the changing um, color collodion. I say fruit maybe. And the changing yellow to green and how that – literally you can see that. Maybe it's in my Dropbox. Let me go over to Dropbox real quick. I'll see if I can find it since we have a couple of minutes here. Uh, Dropbox.com. Uh, let's see. I don't see it there either. If I can even get in there. I could go to my book and pull it up too, I guess, huh? That would might be a, a thing to do. Let me let me stop sharing this for just a second here. How oh, times I've really been enjoying all the recommended reading and watching that you've been. Oh, thank you, Tom. That's that's great to know. Yeah. The the bottom line here is really if you have if you have the preoccupation about photography, I never tire of reading, watching, listening. If it has something to do with photography, and the older, the better for me. Um, 
I love it. And I also love things uh, with music, too. And if you have Netflix, we just watched, Jeannie and I <clears throat> just watched a great documentary the other night. Uh, it reminded me of um, uh, Jeffrey turned us on to Rumble um, on Netflix, that, that great piece about Native American influence in music, rock and roll and R&B. There's a great show on Netflix called Count Me In. It's about drummers. And man, if you like music, most photographers, I, I don't want I don't want to say all of them, but most photographers, most creative people it like music. Um, that's kind of a given. So if you like that, um, jump over to Netflix if you have it and check it out. Jeffrey says, can you talk a bit about farmers reducer? Sure, absolutely. Um, farmers reducer, uh, that is uh, ferrocyanide. That is uh, something that you use, and you can use this in wet collodion. Of course, you can use it on prints. You can use it, you know, silver gelatin prints. Um, this is a, uh, you know, I've seen people dip Q-tips in and take, it's like the Photoshop of, of taking silver off your plate, basically. So if you wanted to do, do a vignette around your plate, you could put some farmer's reducer. Basically, you'll just eat away the, the silver on it. So these are used to, if you're overexposed, right, you can, um, you can use uh, ferrocyanide to do that. Um, and that's, again, the, the, that's where cyanides get mixed up, right? Oh, I'm going to use that. To, and you throw your plate into a farmer's reducer, basically. Let me, let me look here real quick. Um, you throw a, a plate into that and you're going to end up not with a cleared plate, but you, you can end up with a eaten a complete eaten away plate. Um, let's see. Uh, what do we have here? here? Here, Here's probably a good one. Farmers reducers for prints. Um, so potassium ferrocyanide, potassium bromide, and water. So here's a, and you, you can, you know, and that's that's what it is. It's, it's uh, oh, for negatives as well, too. It's just a little stronger or weaker. Um, let me, let me post this up here. There's a, there's a uh, farmer's reducer recipe. And let me put it in the private chat. No, you can do it anytime. Anytime. It's got silver on it. Jeffrey, you're good to go. So potassium ferrocyanide is not potassium cyanide. That's what I, I don't know how many times I've had that question, but it's always the farmer's reducer. Um, that Did that post completely in there? I don't know. Yeah. Formula, let's see. For normal use. Let me just make sure that this is in there. You got the first part of it. Stock B solution. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's good stuff. And you can, uh, if you're into that or you need to, Kind of do the the uh, you know re reduction in your plate if you're if you want to or, or just play with it. Period. You know. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Have a nice place. Good to see you. Yo, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Colonialista. Happy to do that. I was going to look in here. Oh, it's still trying to sign into Dropbox. I don't know what's wrong with Dropbox. I was going to still. Give me just a second here. I'm going to try to find my book, uh, my old book, and see if we can find that uh, um, image of the fruit. I posted it. I don't know how many times I've posted it up online over the years. I, I keep posting stuff and posting stuff. And here's uh, here's one I found here. Th this might be interesting to you since we're talking. I'm really interested in, you know, Having how understanding how collodion sees light and what that means, it's uh, so critical. Um, why so many um, collodion images fail is because the people that are making them don't understand how and what types of collodion, how, how collodion sees certain colors and how it what spectrum it operates on, and then how it can. You, you've all seen these kind of convoluted images that are just too busy they make my head spin right i mean let me just show you this one here i'm just looking through these real quick to see if i can find that i uh, search color i got one here to oh color fruit no 
I always I always bring these up. Web checker. Oh, somebody sent me a bunch of good examples of, of color, how it sees color, but um, let me share this here. Clothing sees light. There we go. I'll share this real quick. And you can kind of, you'll get the idea here. Share the screen. Yes, exactly. Yes, Jeffrey. Yep, absolutely. Share. Let me share this. Uh, and most of you have seen this, of course. Uh, what Collodion sees for light. So, so here we, this is my illustration of it. This is this is general. This is not exactly precise in the nanometers, but so down here at 440 nanometers, we're we're off into the the violets, the blues and violets, and going off into the UV down here. Oh, infrared. Sorry, I, I said gamma earlier. I'm mistaken. And up here around 690 nanometers is a clothing sees black. Here around 550, 560 nanometers, it starts falling off rapidly. So keep in mind when you're making images, keep the color spectrum in mind, keep the content of how you're using the light on your scene in mind, because it makes a huge difference. One of the reasons uh, collodion images are successful is because they're well lit, they're well composed, and they're using the right type of colors in the image, right? That's, that's a big thing. So you get up here past 740, 750 nanometers, you're into the infrared, and it's black. <clears throat> now, a lot of people ask me, well, the old man, you'll say use calico yellow in your darkroom on your windows. Well, you can see calico yellow would be about 625 nanometers. I like to push it up. I like to go into the red. I like to use ruby lift. There's no chance of fogging or having any light sources coming in your darkroom or whatever you're working on. So the, the more you can push it out there, the better, I think. Um, let's see. Uh, let's check this out. Hey, Chris. Hi, Quinn. Your book arrived. I ate it up. Oh, thank you for the support. I appreciate that. What problems would I expect if I have a liter of silver bath nitrate but use a small amount to sensitize a small plate in a 4 by 5 covered tray? Then pour it back into the stock liter bottle. Um, I remember you mentioned use the entire bath. Okay, that's a really great question, Chris. This, this, this will apply to, to everybody thinking about that. So what he's saying is, I just want to pour a little bit out in a 4 by 5 tray, you know, just a little bit of silver nitrate out of my one liter bottle that I mixed up. And I want to sensitize a couple of 4 by 5 plates in that tray. Tray sensitization is great. It's it, it Just keep it rocking, keep it moving. It allows that ether and alcohol to evaporate off. It's a little bit even better than tanks. But if you maintain your stuff, tanks are great too. Um, so he's asking, what do I do with that silver bath there? Do I keep separate it out of the tray and keep it in another bottle? No, pour it back into the original bottle. And you can just keep using it like that. In fact, you're going to get more life out of that, doing it that way, or more life before you maintain it than other ways. You, you, look, it's all about quantity. So if you had a one liter tank and you poured that entire liter and you only sensitize two or three or four four by fives, that's going to last hundreds of four by fives or a hundred four by fives before you need to do anything with it. So as you're working it with a with a tray, you're allowing that solvent to evaporate off. It's a good method. The problem with the tray is is you got to stay in the red or in the dark, you know, the entire time, even if you cover it up. But that's a great question. Pour it back into the bottle and keep using it like that. It'll it'll keep you honest. So great question. Hello, Mr. Analog. Good to see you, brother. Um, do many experiment with making a test plate of various different, differently colored strips of textile lined up together to visualize the difference? Seems like it would be an educational experience. That's a chopper. That's a great thing to do. If you're going to do portraits, and just because you think Quinn's overalls are going to look great, and yeah, oh, they look great. You know, in this light with my eyes may not translate at all in collodion. You've had this happen. I guarantee you, if you've done portraits, people ask me, what should I wear to the portrait? You're going to make my portrait. What should I wear to, to have my portrait done? 
I always tell them darker colors. And if you if you wear, <laughs> check this out. If you wear something striped and it's down in that indigo violet color and your eyes just kind of translate that kind of light striped shirt and then you photograph them clothing, they're going to look like they're in a prison uniform. I mean, it it it's incredible how this stuff translates. You really have to pay attention to it. So, yeah, that's a good thing to do is try to find. Um, you're very welcome, Chris. Thanks for your support. I appreciate that. You're going to find you're going to have to find. What works um, and what really what, what you're going to do is you're going to find what doesn't work is, is what's going to happen. And so keep that in mind as you go through all this stuff, not to get uh, not to see with the, the spectrum, visible spectrum of light that we with our eyes and think collodion is going to translate that. I always tell people collodion has a whole different story to tell when it comes to color. So. Yeah, a light blue shirt always looks better than a white shirt. I would agree. And and to back that up, Tom, if if a sitter has white a white shirt on, uh, in, inevitably it's going to look like it's stained somewhere where the shadow creases or where it's. You're right. Blue is your white. Indigo, violet, blue is your brightest, most violent white. Is is the as Hardwich said just a minute ago in his book. Um, but that's that's a great idea, Chopper. Let's see if I can find uh, one more. I just saw something in in here. Somebody sent me this. Let's see. I I, I want to make sure I give them credit for it if I show it on here. Um, but I can always guess who sent me these. But let let here's a color chart somebody sent to me. I don't know. I got it in my file. So let's pull it up and see. This might give you a little bit better idea. Um, I got it. I don't know who did this either. The exposure isn't that great on it, but we're, we'll forgive that for sure. So let me download that one and then get the actual color chart here and digital and download that one. And you'll be able to see the difference here. This is a pretty good. Um, Analogy or idea, but not uh, completely. I got a little bug flying around me here. Share, share screen, window. Oh, I should open them, huh? Show all. Uh, where are they? There, there, there. Can I open both of them at the same time? Okay, I can open. Okay, I can do that. So check this out. Here's a here's a fair representation. I think you'll get the idea here anyway. Um. So there's the color chart. There's the collodion of that color chart. Um, which, you know, look at that white. That is just crazy, isn't it? The white is almost black. Oh, there you go. Oh, you got one, Jeffrey. Let's let's see. Let, let's pull you up here. Solo layout. Here's... Oh, did you send that to me? No, yours is much better. Oh, yeah, there you go. You should can you share that on your screen so everybody can see it? Okay, there's the color chart there. Okay, so look at the indigos. Yeah, look at the indigos in there. That's crazy. So look at that limited. I mean, that's the point, right? That's a very limited spectrum of, uh, of color that it sees. Keep that in mind, guys. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Jeffrey. That's, that's awesome. That's a very, very limited of col uh, spectrum of color. Then you also... The way you light the scene and how many objects are what you have in that scene. Super, super important to keep those things in mind. So keep all that in mind as we go through the journey of trying to make images that make sense and, and fulfill our ideas of what we want to do. So, okay, guys, ladies and gentlemen, I think that will do it for us. Um, what's the story here? I'm, uh, I've got my. Dark room project. Uh, I just got finished with the deck. I, we've been sitting out on our deck last night and this morning having coffee. It's wonderful. Saw an eagle the other day. Great big bald eagle. Just beautiful. Just just gorgeous. Saw a big um, rafter of turkeys. Two tom turkeys and a bunch of hens down in our little meadow. Just I love it. Life is good. I hope the same for you. 
Stay healthy, stay happy, and we'll be back next Saturday. If anybody wants to come in and share something, I got a couple of people lined up. I don't know exactly when they'll come in and share. But if you want to share work, you want to share an idea, don't be afraid. Drop me an email. We'll get you on here and share it with people. A lot of people watch these afterward. People, I get email all the time saying, hey, I watched this video from eight months ago and this and that. And uh, and, and it helped him. So I appreciate and, and really am grateful for your support. I'm humbled by it. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you next Saturday. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay happy. Bye-bye. Oh, piss. Here. Uh, turn it around. Turn it around, Hank. Turn it around. <laughs> I don't think he's saying he's pissed, is he? Is he pissed up? No. Ah, yeah, got you. Okay. You have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.